Well, welcome back to session three of our emphasis here at First Baptist Church of Searcy on prayer and how that can impact our church as a whole and you individually as a believer, uh, your household, your family, and uh, that is what we are seeking to do is just to, to dive deeper into our prayer life and let God change our lives uh, as his word tells us he will when we engage with him in prayer. As I mentioned, we are in session three. Uh, the last two weeks, uh, uh, Pastor Brian and Brother Hal have facilitated our video sessions here, and we have heard from Dr. Bill Elif, whose book we are in the process of going through right now, right now Prayer with No Intermission, 40 Days of Unceasing Prayer. And at this point, hopefully you're following along with us. We should be somewhere around day 14 of our 40 days of unceasing prayer. And let me challenge you to stay faithful and to stay committed to that, and uh, let's finish that out strong as we continue on through here. As I mentioned, uh, uh, we've the last two weeks we went through session one and session two with Pastor Brian and Brother Hal and of course Dr. Bill Elif. If you missed those sessions, you can go back and you can catch those on our church website, fbccersey.org, and you can get caught up. But tonight we're going to jump into session three, which is titled, What to Pray. We've looked at things like why we should pray, um, but sometimes we know what we're supposed to do and uh, the words just kind of escape us. I want you to think about a time maybe in your life where you've, you've met somebody or you've been in a situation where there just are no words, the words aren't coming. Uh, you maybe feel a little awkward because um, maybe you've met somebody, maybe a personal hero or something like that and you're just almost dumbfounded and you don't know what to say. Well, sometimes I think we do that in our, in our prayer life as believers. We know we're supposed to pray. The Bible tells us to pray. We know that there are benefits to prayer. And so we try to set that side of time, uh, set aside that time, excuse me, and, uh, but then we don't know what to say. And uh, the words just aren't there. Well, what I love about one of the things we're going to look at tonight is Jesus anticipated that in us as his children. He anticipates that at times we may not know what to say. And he gives us an outline. He gives us a prayer. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 6 tonight. And probably one of the most famous passages in all of Scripture. We call it the Lord's Prayer. And uh, Dr. Bill Elif is going to walk us through an outline that follows the outline of the Lord's Prayer that will help facilitate and give us the words to pray when we don't know what to pray. It gives us that starting point. And so as we dive in tonight to session three with Dr. Elif, I want to challenge you. Grab your Bible. Grab yourself a, a notepad and a pen or maybe your phone, some way where you can take some notes. Because I said, he's going to give us um, an outline, some, some key words that you can keep handy and you can pull out in those times of prayer when you just don't know what to say. But before we jump in, let me uh, just uh, challenge you to open your Bible with me, turn to Matthew chapter 6, and let's read through the Lord's Prayer and then we'll hear from Dr. Eliph. Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 9, Jesus says, Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Let's jump into session 3. Can I tell you about one of my most embarrassing moments? I had the privilege years ago as a young pastor to be involved in a Billy Graham crusade in Oklahoma City where I was pastoring. And somehow I was put on a, a committee to, to lead a, a particular committee. And one day I got an invitation to go to the governor's mansion to have lunch with Billy Graham. Well, I was so excited. Uh, Holly and I got all ready and went down. We thought there would be thousands of people there, but it was just 25 men and their wives uh, in this special meeting with Dr. Graham. We were in the foyer of the governor's mansion, and uh, we were sitting there sipping our coffee, and Holly leaned forward and said, Do you want to meet Billy Graham? And I said, Well, of course. She said, He's right behind you. And I turned around, and Dr. Graham was about, was about 6'3 or 6'4. He's a big, broad-shouldered man. And I turned around, and there was Billy Graham. And I, for the first time in my life, was totally speechless. I didn't know what to say. 
Finally, after what seemed like an hour and a half of awkward silence, Dr. Graham leaned down and said, Hello, I'm Billy Graham. And I looked at him and said, I'm Billy Elif. And that's all that came out of my mouth. Do you ever feel like that in prayer? That you come into the presence of the King of Kings, the Lord of the universe, and you just don't know what to say. Jesus anticipated that. And that's why he gives us in Matthew 6 a very clear pattern and progression in prayer. It could be the pattern that you use or the components that you use in prayer for the rest of your life if you just learn what he meant in Matthew 6 beginning in verse 9. And I want to give you some words to just be pegs in the wall of your praying mind about how to pray. First of all, as we enter into the throne room, we began to pray with adoration. Adoration. Here's how Jesus said it. When you pray, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. When you come into the throne room with God and you've come sincerely and you've entered in and you, you see the Lord, it doesn't make sense to me that we would just walk in and begin to babble out all kinds of different prayers. I think we would come in and the first thing we would do would be fall on our face. We would adore Him. We would notice His beauty, His holiness, His power, His graciousness, His loving kindness. So Jesus says, when you enter in, the first thing you should do is just adore the Lord. Give thanks to Him for who He is and what He's done. Here's the question. As I began to pray, what do I notice about God in His presence today? I have to voice that in prayer. Secondly is alignment. Then we pray this, Jesus said, Thy kingdom come and Thy will be done on earth as it's being done right now, is the thought, in heaven. Can I give you a great revelation? Prayer is not about changing God's mind to get Him to do what your will is. It is getting in the presence of God so your will becomes aligned with His will and you pray it into your current circumstance. So part of prayer is listening to the Lord, talking to the Lord, reading His Word, and then saying, Lord, we need Your kingdom. I see that You want this to happen so Your kingdom can come in my life or the life of one of my children or in my school or at work, that Your will can be done in our church. And so there are a thousand ways to pray like this and a thousand prayers to pray. Here's the question. Where is God wanting to bring His kingdom and His will today? Then I ought to pray about that. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Thirdly, what I would call access. Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread. One of the greatest prayer books I've ever read is Prayer by Hallisby. And he begins in the first chapter saying that one of the great passages on prayer is Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's writing to a church. And if any man will open the door, I will come in and I'll sup with him and he can sup with me. We'll have communion together. Prayer is opening the door to Jesus. It's giving him access to your needs and the needs of those around you. So this is why Jesus said every day you ought to pray and open the door so God can come into the equation of your life. We ought to pray about our needs, our children's needs, our family's needs. But notice he says, pray this way, uh, give us this day our daily bread. In other words, I'm not, I'm not just saying, give me this day my daily bread. I should pray for that. I'm included in the hour prayer. But I need to pray for others, opening up the door for God to go into the life 
of somebody that I love, somebody that's sick, somebody that's needy, somebody that's far from God. I need to pray, God, would you bring your daily bread there? Give them today exactly what they need. If you just, if you just spent time praying there, just think about it. You could pray for hours on end for your needs and the needs of those around you. The next word I would give you is assessment. Jesus said it like this, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. If you are in the presence of the Lord in prayer, I can promise you one thing is going to happen. You're going to see your sin. In the presence of the holiness of God, we uh, are not Him yet. <laughs> he is conforming us and transforming us into His image. And one of the ways that He does that is every day as we're praying, He shows us little areas of our life that are wrong. He doesn't want us to ignore these, to explain them away, to blame others. He just wants us to admit our sin and acknowledge our need. So as you're praying, God shows you you've had an unforgiving heart or God shows you a bitterness or God shows you some anger. Then deal with that in prayer. His forgiveness is there because of the cross but we're to ask the Lord, Lord, would you forgive and cleanse me from this sin? And in the same breath, Jesus is very adamant that he wants us to forgive others just as he is forgiving us. So I assess my life, see where I am in my spiritual journey, and do business with God and grow with God in this matter of prayer, assessment. So adoration, alignment, access, uh, assessment, and then armor. Jesus said every day we ought to pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Or it could be translated, deliver us from the evil one. These are prayers of spiritual warfare. The enemy is all around us. In fact, we have three enemies, the world and its philosophies, our flesh, our humanity and its weakness, and the devil and his overpowering deception and temptations. And so God calls us every day to pray great prayers of spiritual warfare, protection over us and all of those we're praying for. And then finally, acknowledgement. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The writer of Proverbs says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge Him. In other words, we can go through our day and never acknowledge God. Never think about God. So at the end of my prayer, I'm saying to the Lord, Now God, I realize, I acknowledge that Thine is the kingdom. Not mine is the kingdom. This is not about me. This is about You. This is not about my glory, it's about your glory. Thine is the kingdom and the glory and the power forever and ever. Jesus gave us the perfect pattern and components of prayer that can fuel your life once learned for the rest of your life. So let's pray. Lord, I pray that these components that you gave us as a pattern for prayer would be so deeply ingrained in our life that there would never be a time again when we don't know what to pray and how to pray. Take us there in this 40-day journey. In Jesus' name and for your glory, we pray. Amen. Well, I hope you enjoyed that from Dr. Bill Elif. Um, it's always a neat thing and a refreshing thing to take such a familiar passage of scripture like the Lord's Prayer and to see it in a little bit of a new light. And so he walked us through six words that the Lord's Prayer uses to guide us into a more vibrant prayer life. And um, I don't know about for you, but for me, having little key words like that or outlines always help and uh, help me remember those things. And so if you miss some of those, um, we're going to walk back through those here in just a second. But um, I really challenge you, write these down. Maybe even put them in the margin of your Bible here uh, in Matthew chapter 6 
or in your phone something that, that's handy that you can grab in those moments where, where you're, you go to the Lord in prayer and don't know the words to say that can just remind you and give you and facilitate um, the, your, your prayer time with the Lord. And so he, uh, like I said, he, he walked us through six words uh, through the Lord's Prayer. And the first of those was adoration. The word adoration, we start off our prayer time. The Lord, Jesus starts the Lord's Prayer with our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And that term hallowed there simply means to honor as holy. And so his name is a holy name and we should honor it as such. Um, as worship leader here at our church, um, I, I take the songs that we sing very seriously and analyze the lyrics very closely um, before we sing them as a church. And there's a song that we sing here uh, fairly regularly, uh, 10,000 Reasons, Bless the Lord, O My Soul. And it comes straight from Psalm 103. And as we think about this idea of adoration and adoring Him, blessing His holy name, uh, honoring His name as holy, Verse 2 of, of the song, 10,000 Reasons, gives us a, a way and some reasons that we have to hallow his name, to honor his name. It says, you're rich in love, you're slow to anger, your name is great, and your heart is kind. For all your goodness, I will keep on singing 10,000 reasons for my heart to find. And so I challenge you in moments and in times where you're looking to adore him, Open up your Bible to Psalm 103 and you will see things like the song says directly from Psalm 103 and it will give you uh, reasons, it will give you ways, it will give you um, those reasons to adore him and to hallow his name, to honor it as holy. And so we start with adoration, hallowed be your name. We move on to alignment. It says your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So many times we take our prayer life and I think we flip it on its head and we make it about us rather than who it really truly is about, which is our Savior. Because as believers, everything in our life, everything in creation is pointing to and is for the glory of our Savior. And so we, we turn our prayer life about us and our requests, our needs, where we need His help, where we need Him to provide, where we need Him to intervene what we need him to do. And I don't know about you, but that, that's challenging to me as I think about the alignment of my prayer life because so many times I come to him in prayer and it's just about what I need. And I'm not thinking about his kingdom being done. I'm thinking about my kingdom and what I need to see done in my kingdom, not his, and asking that his, my kingdom would reflect his. That's ultimately what we're asking here when we say your kingdom come, your will be done on earth in our kingdom as it is in heaven, in his kingdom. So Lord, would you bring your kingdom, bring heaven down into our world and may our world align with yours. So we adore him. We seek to be aligned with him. And as I think about this idea of alignment, James chapter 4, uh, there's a passage of scripture here that I'm going to read verses... Um, three through nine that I want you to see. And this just helps us put ourselves in perspective of who he is, his holy name that we, um, our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We're, we're, we're honoring him as holy and then we're aligning ourself with him. James chapter four, verse three says, you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is of no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace. I love that line right there. He gives more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched, mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning. Let your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Not exactly an uplifting passage necessarily, 
but it tells us that when we humble ourselves, when we realize who we are, uh, the wretched sinners that we are, turning our joy to mourning, our laughter to weeping, when we humble ourselves, we align ourselves with his holy name, he will exalt us, he will lift us up. We adore his name, we align ourselves with him and his will, his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And then the third word that Dr. Eliff gave us was access. And that phrase, give us this day our daily bread. And so the Lord Jesus here in his prayer, the Lord's prayer, does give us space to, to bring before him our needs and our requests. Give us this day our daily bread. There are daily things that we need. Uh, the Lord to provide for us and to give us. And so in this prayer, he gives us that space. He allows access for that. But notice the order. It's only after we adore him and his holy name and we align ourselves with him and his holiness and we realize who we are in comparison to him and then we humbly say, give us this day our daily bread. But let me point out also the pronouns in that phrase right there. It's not just about us. Give us this day. It's not just about you individually. I'm included in us and the hour, our daily bread. Give me my daily bread. But it doesn't say that. It says give us. And so pray for those around you. Pray for your family. Pray for your friends, your church members, uh, those in need that are around you. Pray for their needs as well as your own, maybe even before your own. Because again, we're humbling ourselves in alignment with a holy God. And we're praying for not just ourselves, but for those around us as we say, give us this day our daily bread. And then the fifth word was armor. We realize that we face a spiritual war each and every day. Dr. Eliff said that we face three enemies, the world, our own flesh, and then of course the devil himself. And so as we face those each and every day, we must pray um, this, this phrase here uh, of lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And we claim that, we know that when we have the armor of God on, that God will deliver us from the evil one. And then we finish, um, I love the way this is kind of bookended here, with acknowledgement. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 commands us to trust in the Lord with all of our heart, lean not on our own understanding, and all of our ways acknowledge God. And so we acknowledge him as the one that we place our trust in. We're not trusting in ourselves, we're not hoping in ourselves, but that takes us right back to the beginning where we adore him and his holy name of who he is. So when we adore him and his holy name, we align ourselves in his holiness and humble ourselves before him. He gives us access to ask for those daily needs that we need. Um, we, oh, I skipped one. I apologize. We skipped the assessment. That goes all the way back to number four, the assessment, taking inventory of our heart, confessing our sin before the Lord. And, uh, and, and taking inventory of those things that need to be cleansed, that we need to be purified of. Um, as we ask for those, those daily needs, those, uh, the, the daily bread, the requests that we have, we must first assess ourselves and ask God to cleanse our heart, give us a pure heart. James wrote that, I read that just a moment ago. Cleansing our hands, purifying our hearts before the Lord. Adoration, alignment, access, assessment, the armor of God protecting us as we go about this spiritual warfare and then we acknowledge that he is the one that we put our trust in that we put our faith in and our hope because we can't do it only he can so for the rest of our time together we'll wrap this up we are going to pray in light of what we have learned today in regards to the lord's prayer and so i'm going to guide us through some various parts of the lord's prayer and i would invite you to just focus on what's on your screen and uh, to pray through these things, uh, maybe individually or with your spouse or your family around. And if you even need to, to pause the video for just a moment to, to reflect and take the time that you need um, to, to pray through these things, uh, please feel free to do so. First, let's start off this time of prayer with uh, the same way that Jesus does in the Lord's Prayer. That phrase, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Let's spend the next few moments simply in adoration of who God is. If you even need to take your Bible out, turn to Psalm 103 that I referenced earlier and just read through that and, and worship the Lord and adore Him for who He is. Let's pray together.
Secondly, the phrase, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's ask God to let his kingdom come in specific places in our life and in our community. Where is God wanting to bring his kingdom into your kingdom today? Would you pray about that and ask the Lord to reveal that to you in these next few moments? Give us this day our daily bread. Where do we need God's provision? Where do you need God's provision in your life? But let me also remind you of those pronouns, us and our. Think about those around you, not just about yourself. Think about those around you, family members, friends, fellow church members. What are some other ways that we can go before God and ask him to give us our daily bread for yourself and for those around you? What is it that you need to pray for yourself and how can you pray for others. Let's spend a few moments praying that. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Where do you need forgiveness and cleansing in your life right now? Bring this before the Lord in silence. What areas of your life do you need to confess and ask God to forgive? Take a moment and express those to the Lord and ask for his forgiveness that he so freely gives. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Let's spend the next few moments in prayer together, asking the Lord to purify our hearts and the heart of our church and empower us to stand strong in the midst of temptation. And also pray prayers of uh, spiritual protection over areas of your life, your family members, and of our church. Finally, we end with just a doxology, a praise to the Lord. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. In these last few moments, what are some ways that we need to acknowledge God 
in our lives, in our work, and in our community. Let's spend these few moments just acknowledging God, praising Him for who He is as we wrap up this time of prayer. Father, we do just worship you and praise you for who you are. We thank you that in our weakness and in our humanity, you anticipated and you saw that we would struggle with prayer at times. And so you gave us in your word, you gave us an example of how to pray. And so may we not neglect that. May we take advantage of these tools that you've given us through Dr. Ellis' teaching. And may we stay faithful throughout this week of being people of unceasing prayer. We thank you for this time and pray that you have been honored and glorified in it. It's in your name that we pray and ask these things. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us again, everybody. Stay faithful in your reading and in your prayers this week, and we'll see you next week.